Hello and welcome to Entipedia since we have already seen the basics of secret key cipher systems in the previous lesson. Today we will look into the basics of asymmetric cryptography also known as public key cryptography. Come with us. Hi, as we saw in our previous lesson, communications that use symmetric cryptography require that the sender and the recipient of the ciphered message know the key. Yes, and the problem I found was how to send the recipient the key I had used to cipher my message. Because if it was someone that I knew and that lived nearby, I could meet that person and give them the key in a flash drive. But if that person lived far away, or if I had to send the message to different people, then that solution wouldn't be possible. That's true. Until the mid-20th century, few people really needed to use cryptography, the military, diplomats and some corporations. That is why symmetric key cryptography was enough for them. They could spend time and money in key distribution. For example, the army could send them guarded by soldiers, politicians could protect them with the use of security forces and big corporations could hire security guards. That's great. But I can hire a security guard to send the key to my friend. Of course, that's the problem. By the end of the 20th century, the use of cryptography was highly in demand. So it was essential to find a mechanism able to distribute secret keys in a safe, quick and accessible way for everyone. Yes, I have encountered that problem. How to send the secret key in a safe way through an insecure channel. Let's go back to the locks, Bob. Think of a single lock with its key. The lock will represent a cipher algorithm and the key will represent the cipher key. Okay. Two operations can be done with the lock. Opening and closing it. Exactly. One of the operations can be easily done by anyone. Yes, closing it. You only have to press the hook in until it clicks. That's right. The other operation can only be done by one person. And that's the person with the key. The one that can open it. Everybody knows how to close the lock by pushing it in. But only one person can open it. The person who has the specific key and not any given key. And how can I send a secret key using the lock? Nowadays, this is very easy. Imagine that you have the secret key written in a paper inside an envelope. Your friend has a box like this one, as well as a lock with its key. What would you do to send him your secret key? I know, I would tell my friend to send me the box with the open lock, since anyone can close a lock, I would put the envelope with my secret key inside the box and then close the lock, this way, since my friend has the key, he would be the only one that can open it. If someone were to intercept the box, they wouldn't be able to open it, because they wouldn't have the key. Excellent, those are exactly the basics of how public key cryptography works. Logically, Alice, we won't use locks to encrypt information. No, of course not. It's an analogy to help us understand how public key ciphering algorithms work. We have two keys, one is public and, therefore, known by everybody, and the other is private, known only by its owner, although anyone can encrypt using the public key, only the person who has the private key can decrypt. Now I understand the comparison with the lock. Anyone can close it but only the person with the key can open it. You got it. A pair of keys is used in this type of cryptography, one to cipher and another to decipher. The public key should be known by everyone to make its distribution easier. Since it is better if everybody knows it, I can put it on my website, send it by email or even include it in my business card. Am I right? Yes. When someone knows your public key, they can send you ciphered messages knowing that only you will be able to decipher them, because only you have the private key that corresponds to that public key. Of course, it is very important that you keep the private key safely, so only you, and no one but you, knows it. Now I get it. That is why public key cryptography is also called asymmetric. Right. 
That's it. If you encrypt a message with a public key, you won't be able to decrypt it using the same key. You will have to use the private key. What is ciphered with one key must be deciphered with the other key. In discrete mathematics, this is called multiplicative inverse. But that topic will be studied in another lesson. Can the private key be used to encrypt as well? Yes, there is no need to use the public key only for ciphering and the private key only for deciphering. It can be done the other way around. Hold on a second. If I cipher something with my private key, then anyone who knows my public key can decipher it. And everybody can know my public key. So, what's the point in doing that? That's the point. Only you can cipher and anyone can decipher. Well, I still don't see the point of that. Since that operation can only be done by you, the point of this is that you can sign a message. Like putting my signature on it. No. Not that kind of written signature, but a digital signature. If you think about it, encrypting a message with your private key is the same as signing it, because only the person who owns the private key could have encrypted that message. Oh, I see. When you cipher something with your private key, you are demonstrating your authorship, because only you could have ciphered it. That is called authentication. Although ciphering with your private key doesn't provide confidentiality to your message, that is, it has no secrecy. It does ensure authentication. Only you could have ciphered it, so it's the same as having signed it. So then, anyone can decipher it using my public key, which would be the equivalent of verifying my signature. Well thought out. That is why it is so important that your private key remains a secret, and that only you have access to it. Since asymmetric ciphering algorithms are in fact very slow, they aren't usually used to cipher complete messages, only an abstract of the message. Anyway, in a future lesson we will see hash functions, digital signatures and how they provide integrity to the messages. And what if an attacker were to use my public key to decipher the message that I have ciphered with my private key and then cipher it with his or her private key? What would happen then? When the recipients would try to verify your signature or, in other words, try to decipher the message using your public key, they would come up with a message that makes no sense because you can't decipher a text that has been ciphered with a private key using a non-matching public key. This has to do with the multiplicative inverse that we mentioned earlier. In other words, when I cipher something with my private key I can't say later that I didn't sign it. Exactly. You can't deny you signed it. This property of asymmetric ciphering is called non-repudiation since you cannot repudiate your messages. That's another good reason to keep my private key safe. No one will be able to forge your signature as long as they don't have your private key, of course, so be sure to keep it safe. And. How can I keep it safe? The pair of keys should be kept in an intelligent card, like the Spanish electronic id, for instance, although there are other ways of doing so. There's something I still don't understand, Alice. How is it possible that knowing the public key, it isn't possible to decrypt a message that has been encrypted with it? A good asymmetric key algorithm will make it impossible to obtain any information regarding the private key or to decipher a message that has been ciphered with it, even though the public key is known to understand and how they work. First you have to learn about one-way functions. We will analyze in detail this subject in a future lesson. I have been thinking about sending my private key using the public key of the recipient. And? I have a question. How do I know that a user's public key is in fact his or her? key and that it hasn't been changed by an attacker. Very sharp Bob. Someone could have intercepted my friend's public key and changed it to their own key. If I were to send my private key using that public key, that is in fact the attacker's key, that person would be able to decipher my message easily and obtain my private key. Then use my friend's public key to cipher it again and send it to him. Neither my friend nor I would find out, so the attacker would have obtained the private key and be able to decipher the messages we cipher with it. Well done Bob, you have just pointed out a serious problem with public key cryptography. What you have just described is known as the man in the middle attack, often abbreviated MITM. How can I know that someone's public key really belongs to that person and not to an imposter? That, my friend, is the confidence problem. We already saw how difficult it was to distribute secret keys safely, now we will see how difficult it is to distribute public keys in a reliable manner. 
Is there any solution? Nowadays, it has been solved, at least partially, using digital certificates and the PKI public key infrastructures. How do these infrastructures work? We will look into that in a future lesson. I think we have seen enough for today. At the Entirepedia website you will find additional documents for this lesson. See you next time. See you at our next lesson.